Madam President. Senator from Georgia. Madam President, I ask you unanimous consent to be able to address the Senate. To Without objection. Question. Thank you, Madam President. It's an honor to be here today on what's not my last day, but everybody's like acting like it. A few months ago, I had to announce that after much consideration, to be able to continue to serve the people of Georgia as best I could in any way possible, but also to keep true to my commitments I've made in every race I ever won. When I knew I couldn't do the job, I was going to quit and let somebody do it who wouldn't be hampered. I'm not hampered yet. I'm pretty tough, but it's getting close. So in, in uh, August, I decided to talk to my wife about it, and we decided to uh, go ahead and retire at the end of this, at the end of, of December, which I've announced and said I was going to do. Governor of Georgia is making an appointment to take my place. And a few days from now, you might look in a history book somewhere, current history. And they might have an Isaacson in the glossary, but I doubt it. You may not never see this name again. I've been here for 15 years and loved every minute of it. This is the most enjoyable thing I've ever done in my life to be a part of the United States Senate. Not because I like to be a senator, but because I like to be the people who are in the Senate. Politicians get a bad rap this day and time, a real bad rap. A lot of things that are said about them by people who, where it doesn't matter, like those in some of the media and some of those places. But others as well take pot shots at people who are politicians and who serve the people in the community. I never do that, not because I am one, but because I know, because I am one, what you have to do. It's a tough job, and if it's not done, it's not done right. It doesn't get done the way it should for the people there. So I'm making sure that when I leave, and the last thing I do is to leave the people of Georgia in good hands, given the senior senator from Georgia retiring. Unfortunately, today at lunch, the members gave me a, a luncheon and stole all my material. <laughs> I have, don't let's let this paper fool you. I, I throw it all away coming in here. They've stolen all my good jokes took over all the things I was going to say, so I'm going to make this very brief. But in the end, very brief is good. My dad told me one time, he said, son, your words have more power about how few you use than how many you use. I've always remembered that, and I make speeches that are really important. I make short speeches. I get to the point, I get out. And I'm going to give you some reasons that works. But I decided when I knew I was going to be outshined by the other members of the Senate at this luncheon today that I would do the best I could to honor Mitch McConnell, who's the greatest leader I've ever worked for in my 45 years in public life. People like the Vice President of the United States, who I'm so proud is in this year, and I can tell my grandkids, who are all here, by the way, I hope you remember that time you were there with Mike Pence, the Vice President of the United States. You'd be president by then, Mr. Vice President, to hear a speech I made. But to everybody that's here, thank you for being here. I'm not going to call out names because I'd miss somebody, except Tester. You can't miss Tester. <laughs> But everybody else I'd, I'd miss, and I don't want to miss anybody because every one of you are important to me. The people that help us in the lunchroom, the people that help us in the stores, the people that help us get in and out of the cars, help us on bad days, snowy days, icy days, everything else. Just everybody that helps us so much. It takes a lot of people to run a Senate and only one person to mess it up. I want to talk about one subject today and one subject alone, and it's going to be short. But it's, there's something missing in this place. I'm given credit sometimes for being a bipartisan person. In fact, sometimes newspaper people write that I'm known for being bipartisan or being a softy. Some of them say worse than that, but I'm not going to do that. But I am a, a bipartisan person. I never saw people get, done, get things done by not agreeing with each other. You have to come to agreement. I made a living selling houses. You can't ever solve a problem if you've got two people and they won't agree to a price and agree to a time to move. You have to find common ground. Same thing with the law. You can't pass a law. You can't solve a problem. Just period, end of sentence. If you're one of these people who says it's my way or the highway, then we're all in real trouble. So I want to talk about bipartisan, but what bipartisan really is, and I don't think most of you really know what bipartisan is, and I shouldn't say that to an educated group of people like this who've been down a lot of tough trails like I have as well. But bipartisan doesn't mean that a Democrat and a Republican talk to each other every once in a while. It doesn't mean, it means this, that it means that two people come together, probably have differences, probably have a lot of differences, but they find a way to get to the end of the trail where there's a possibility of a solution. And then they do the things you have to do to get that position. America's today is built on people who found a way to get to that end of the solution. No question about it. I hate to ask this question the way I did, but I came in the back door. Is John Lewis here yet? No. Where's John? John, you're getting shorter. <laughs> 
John Lewis is one of the finest people I've ever known and a great friend of mine. We, had, we were invited, I was invited to speak to the Senate a couple of days ago, and, and I recognized John, who was there, and he introduced me and said some things that meant more to me than anything anybody's ever said to me. And so I said, well, I want you to come to, to my, my, my last speech, because I want to say a few things about you. Because in essence, really, John, to a much greater extent than me, but Anne and I together represent what things can change, how things can really change. If people want them to change, they're willing to do the things that let them change. I tell you, John was born in the 1940s. I was born in the 1940s. John went to, was born and uh, lived in Alabama. I lived in Georgia for a while. John came, you got his good census together, and he came to, he heard Shelby, Shelby was there, so he came to Alabama, but uh, he's a good guy. John came there, and John worked, lived in a shotgun house. That's where there's a hole in the back and a hole in the front, and you shoot through it, you don't hit anything. But John was a great civil rights leader in his youth. He was the president of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Violent Co Coordinating Committee. And John walked the streets of Atlanta, Georgia, where I lived. And I was part of the people that Earl Warren, who had all those signs around Georgia. I thought he was running for office. He said, impeach Earl Warren. I never got that figured out until I got a little older. But anyway, Earl Warren had been part of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. The schools were separate, decent, but equal had been thrown out. The schools were going to be integrated. The courts decided the only way to prove that you were doing it done was with numbers. So they figured how much of a percentage of how many black people would constitute a good number to say you were desegregated, and vice versa, solving the, the problem with statistics. I was on some of those first buses that rode to Atlanta, Georgia, taking black students to white schools. And I had some good friends who were black. That's another thing so Southerners are blamed for. It. So we always say, well, we had some really good friends who were black. I have some really good friends who are black. I still got them. One of them is John Lewis. But John Lewis is one of my real heroes in life because I watched what he went through to help us see the light in the South, in my part of the South, Georgia. And he was a hero, and he was a hero to me. And when I got to Congress, one of the most in, proudest things I'm proud of, John introduced me to be sworn in. Vice President, of the, uh, the Speaker of the House swore me in, and I was down on the podium. Let me tell you what happened that morning. The clerk said, uh, we'll now have Mr. Isaacson from Georgia who won a special election yesterday in Atlanta, Georgia, and has been declared the winner by the Secretary of State. We'd like to ask Mr. Lewis to escort him to the front. We'll give him one minute to make his acceptance speech, and we'll go back to business. I said, one minute? God, am I having practicing all these years, and I'm going to get one minute? I can't do anything in one minute. But I wasn't going to argue with the guy my first day at work. <clears throat> so I went to the back of the room with John, and John walked down the aisle on, on the House side. I was not paying a lot of attention. I see the best thing to do is follow John. So I followed John, and when John got through introducing me, I followed him to the well, and I said thank you, everybody, and named three or four people that helped me get there, and then said, well, I'm going to work, <coughs> and I'm honored to be here. What they didn't tell me was that if you're in the House, at that particular day, the mic for the people who are Republicans was on the left. The Republicans spoke from the right. This dummy followed John, who was smart, and went to the right where he was supposed to go. I went to the left, where I wasn't supposed to go. I noticed these eyeballs on the front row just going around and around. And some guy slipped up behind me after I gave my one-minute speech and said, so you're going to start this fast demonstrating what a liberal guy you are. <laughs> it's one of those voices that came over the back of my shoulder, just kind of like a, something hanging over my head. And I turned around and looked, and this other guy came up to me and said, don't pay any attention to that. Named Tom Latham, and he went on about his business. I asked somebody later in the day, well, what was that guy meant that? He said, well, the problem is you got labeled when you got elected. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you got elected to a Republican district, but they said you said nice things about Democrats. I said, is that, is that wrong to do? He said, well, we were trying to get some way to get Boehner not to appoint you to any committee, or the Speaker to not appoint you to any committee. So we heard you help write No Child Left Behind. That was how I started out in the House of Representatives. I was a Republican who was in a majority Democratic House that was unwanted because I was not, in fact, Newt lost, and some of you know this because I see a few faces over there. Newt lost that race by seven votes in the House, seven members who said we won't vote for Newt for Speaker. Newt got reelected, but he couldn't, and Tom knows this, but he couldn't get reelected Speaker, so he, he resigned. And I didn't know he was going to do that. I was going to speak at the National Realtors Conference out in, in uh, Disneyland at a convention. 
Got to the hotel that afternoon, and there were 72 phone messages for me. And the guy came up and said, boy, I hope nobody died at your house. And that's a great way to get to a hotel. I said, why is that? You got 72 messages. I said, well, let me see them. And the first 71 were from my wife. <laughs> and uh, I would call her, and she said, if you heard, I said, heard what? I said, Newt quit. I said, quit what? He quit as speaker, and he quit as a member of the house, and everybody's calling on you to run. I said, what? And it just said nothing computed. But very quickly, I learned a lot about partisan politics. A lot of people wanted to have somebody take Newt's place. He, he knew what body wasn't even cold yet, and they were picking over it. And they wanted to pick their person. They were in some kind of skirmish in some kind of war like that. Anyway, to make a long story short, partisan politics was pretty rough in those days. It's, not, it's a lot rougher now, but it was pretty rough back then. And people voted with, not with their head, but with their a hammer, not the heart, either one. So I learned in an area where if you're a Republican, you're a Republican, Democrat, a Democrat, and don't ever cross. Don't work with anybody. Don't make it easy. Make it, if you got the votes, use them. And I kept, we kept getting beat, or kept gotten out-tricked all the time, or tricks. Out-tricks probably not the right word. Because the whole game plan over there was to have Republican, enough Republicans to be the Democrats, or vice versa. And so that's what everybody would try to do. And I thought that was stupid. But I didn't say that. That's a lot of, 435 is a lot of people, so you don't want to get run over. But to make a, a few days, a few weeks down the line, I made a speech on the floor of the House about something very important to me in my state. It was a problem that we had in the state where our state was divided, rural and urban. Not Republican and Democrat, but rural and urban. But because the Republicans were pretty much rural back then and urban people were Democrats in the suburbs at that time, then it got divided on the political ways anyway, even though it was an economic issue and an ag issue and a shipping issue and things like that. So we got those fights, and they divided up over parties. So by, by the time the issue got to the floor on some kind of compromise vote, we couldn't pass anything. Kidney stone, we couldn't pass a kidney stone, much anything else. Because we couldn't get anybody to agree on anything. We had the parties crossed each other and everybody else. So I, I decided then, if I'm going to be in this thing, I'm, I'm, at that age, I was about uh, 60, I guess. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life down here arguing about silly, stupid things. And there were some silly, stupid things said over there, and I'm not going to say who was saying them, but you know who they were. From both parties, it was bipartisan. That was the first bipartisan thing I saw, the stupid statements. And so to make a long story short, we had some real battles, but finally I decided I'm going to be a, an, ex, an example of what we really need to be like. And I tried to find every way I could to be bipartisan, which meant to me that I did what I thought was right. And I think that's the way to do it. Mark Twain said, when confronted with a difficult decision, do what's right. You'll surprise a few and you'll amaze the rest. Well, I tried to start amazing everybody. I voted for some things. They come over. They'd send somebody over to see me from the whips. I said, "What did you do? I, did you get confused?" No, I didn't get confused. So finally, I know they realized they had some other thing I had to deal with, which was, is the good part of bipartisanship. The first time the partisan people figure you got to you know, deal with you, they come deal with you. Next thing you know, you're sitting at a table with the guys who are making fun of you, and they're not. And that's the way you build partisanship, bipartisanship. And that's the way I did it on my own, going through my six years in the House of Representatives and my 15 years in the United States Senate trying to find that little thing that could pay two people together, not, notwithstanding what party they're in. I didn't ever look at the party first. That's the last thing I'd look at. Chuck Schumer said some nice things today in his, the meeting. One of the nicest things he said to me was that he liked the kindness part of it. He said I was a kind person. My wife might differ with that. Some other people might differ with that. But I try to be a kind person. But I try to be some, somebody that somebody likes to sit down with. Because you can't get a problem solved but you can't sit down across the table from somebody that you got a problem with. And then you, you build everything that way. So I hope this Senate and this Congress and all of us in the years ahead, well, we've got some big problems. We'll start having a main goal personally. We're going to do everything we can to be a part of the solutions and the decisions that are going to have to be made. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But you're going to find something. If you figure out, if you try and do it, others watch you do it, if you start making decisions and making solving problems, you're going to be more popular than other people. This is not a popularity contest, and governing is not a popularity contest. But this is a will of minds. Bipartisanship is a state of being. It's a state of mind. There are people in the United States Senate that I work with, that I love working every day. I'm looking at someone right there in the eye. And they have an attitude that I like. I know I can go sit down and talk to them. If they say, no, I will take it, and I won't stick my tongue at them or call them bad names or anything else. But they know I'll be there tomorrow, ask them to do something for me. Best way to get somebody to do for you something for you is when you hadn't done something for them the day before, then they'll think, maybe I'll help them out. I'll get some help on my side. It's a quid pro quo. Oh, that's a bad word. It's a, 
I was glad I remembered that joke. I'm... But those are the types of things you have to do, <clears throat> even in level of the playing field. So my words to you today are this. When you are fortunate enough to see a John Lewis from Georgia or someone like that, step out of his comfort zone, do what he thinks is right. And somebody tells you he's wrong, don't do that. Judge your conscience and your heart, not some TV commentators or somebody who's loaded with hate. You know, we still have some people in the United States of America who will play the hate card. We have some politicians who will dance around the issue of hate. They won't use the buzzwords, but they'll get awful close to them. They did it in Charlottesville. They did it in other areas. I've had people in the basement of my house from law enforcement from time, from time to time because it gets pretty close. The issues get pretty tough, whether it's college scholarship admissions or whatever it may be. We've got to stand up to the evils of society today because if we don't do it, nobody will. I decided I was going to tell you tonight what I really believe, and that is that America, we've got a problem just like Apollo had. And our problem is we're not going to repeat ourselves. We're not going to exist much longer. We live in the greatest country on the face of this earth. Ain't nobody any, different, any better than the United States of America. Everybody's trying to break in. Nobody's trying to break out. We're always passing laws like they're all trying to break out. They're all trying to break in. Why? Because it's the safest, happiest, richest place in the world. But it is because we're the best people to protect that wealth and that happiness and have enough people to go in the military on a voluntary basis Less than 1% of our population has served in the military. And makes us the strongest defender of freedom and opportunity of anybody in the world. If we ever lose that, if we ever, if we ever lose the, the club, or the two before that the mule gets used to, then we'll lose our coverage of ethics and standby support and all the other things we love and the things we do. We're that close, though. I, I see things happening that I'm asked about by people that scare me. And I've heard some people I know say some things that terrify me. We're better than the hate and vile statements that some people make, and we've got to be better than that. We've got to talk not over them or under them. We've got to talk to them. We've got to sit down and say, why did you say that? Can I, what's your problem? Do we have a problem? Let's get out in the open and, and talk about it. We, we can't, the best country in the world the strongest company in the world cannot succumb to crushing itself inwardly because we look the other way from the challenges of life. And the challenges of life today are America's changing. It's changing for lots of reasons. And a lot of people, they're big internet people, and all, they've got all the solutions. But I think the solution is right here. I think it's in their heart. And I'm telling you from my heart that after 45 years in elected office, raising three children and eight grandchildren, which my kids have done a great job of raising them, uh, living in a great community, working, living in a great church, doing the things I've done. I see some of it slipping away. Churches don't have the memberships they used to have, and it's significant. School curriculums are getting a whole lot more tough than they used to be. And I was the chairman of the Board of Education for a state for a few years. A lot of the traditional things that we all love and believe in, and things God and country, like school curriculum and religion and Sunday school and things like that, they have their challenges. So I'm rolling up my sleeves and whatever of my life I've got left. Because I said I'm going to leave on December 31st, it wasn't because I was leaving you. I'm not leaving you. I'm going to be with you a lot longer than I thought I would because of what I'm doing. I want to be here for you, and I want to be here when that bell rings. Say, America, we don't have a problem anymore. We solved it. You helped us do it through our tax policies, through our federal policies, through our education policies, through how we treat people. We helped you do it. Now, let's don't get back in that shape again. And if we have the people with the spirit of John Lewis and other people I know in this room who are willing to do it, and some who think this is all just a bunch of Sunday school folly raw from somebody who's leaving, don't believe that in a shard because I'll be back to make the speech again sometime and give you a progress report. We need some progress. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, the, the best thing, example to me of what bipartisanship really means is a picture that was taken of John Lewis and I last week. Now, bipartisanship doesn't mean one of you is black and one of you is white. Could be one black one and one white. Could be. But John's black and I'm white, but we're different about other things. But John and I were addressing the Senate at a tribute to me, unfortunately, for everybody else. I loved it, but I didn't like it very much. 
And uh, we had a great time. But when John's time to speak came, he made a beautiful speech that was very meaningful to me because we know what the buzzwords were. We know what we said to make it sound like we were really liberal or op positive. We know we really weren't. But John knew. John knew who deserved cover and who didn't, which takes as much guts as somebody who knows what's right and what's wrong. So John made this beautiful speech, and I said, you know, this is my time to pay John back. All these years he's helped me out, so many things I've done. I went to his 75th birthday because I'm, um, I'm 75. I want to go see what somebody that I look like. So I looked in the mirror and found out it looked like me. But John and I are turning out to be very good friends. So I went to John. I said, John, I want to thank you for that speech. It's the best I've ever heard. And I just re opened my arms and hugged him. Not for a show, not for a display, not for any, any purpose, except to hug him because I love him. I know what he's done to make this a great country, as well as so many other things and many other people. Well, John hugged me. And it got pretty long there for a minute, and that didn't bother me. But the TV people all went crazy. And so the best picture you could have seen last week on the popular pictures and magazines and things like that was John hugging me on the floor of the house. And uh, Tom Graves and uh, all the others from the Georgia delegation that are here, I've seen some. I'm sorry I haven't called everybody's name out, but I haven't been able to see everybody. But they all came up and said, thank you all for doing that. We hope everybody back in Georgia sees that. I said, you know, that's what you're going to tell them at the Senate breakfast, or luncheon next Tuesday. We need to all be seen doing those things they don't expect us to do because we're doing what's right for a change, and I just want to feel good. Part six doesn't, doesn't, politics doesn't need to be a feel-good feel business anymore. It needs to do the right thing business. So I tell you that I'm big, big on bipartisanship. <coughs> Whether you're black or white, Republican or Democrat, whatever it might be. Find a way to find common ground. Give it a chance to work. And if it doesn't, be a future friend. That's my slogan, my staff will tell you. When I start my business, and people wouldn't buy a house from me, I'd, say, I'd shake hands, I'd say, well, thank you for looking with me, and when you buy your next one, call me, I'll do a better job. Because all I have is customers and future customers. So I address everybody as a future customer. And I got some. When I got into politics and started asking people to vote for me, <coughs> I said, all, all I've got out there in, in Georgia is friends and future friends. <coughs> Pardon me. So when we walked away from a Republican meeting somewhere and somebody gave me their right hand to the face and said, we're not going to vote for you. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you another chance in two years. <laughs> so it will be a future friend, not a less weak friend. Friends and future friends is what it's all about. You find anybody in business or anything else today that's making it through life, they're making it through life because they treat it that way. Life is a win-win proposition if you'll do it. It's not a win-lose proposition. It's win-win. But you have to command it, whichever side of the transition you're on. So on a day in which I've had more nice things said about me than I deserved, on a day that brought a lot of clarity to me, clarity to me in terms of how much this place really means, I'm the happiest guy that could ever be. Happy because I haven't cried yet. But more happy because all of you can listen. I think you know what I'm talking about. We can do it. We can do anything. We may be called a liberal. We may be called a rhino. We may be called whatever it is. Let's solve the problem and then see what happens. Most people who call people names and point fingers are people who don't have a solution themselves. They just want to make damn sure you don't solve it. So we got to start doing that. And then bipartisanship will become a way you accomplish things, a way you live. A state of being. It'll be the end of a bad time and the beginning of a new one. And I'm going to live long enough to see both. God bless all of you, and thank you for your support and your friendship to me. It's mean more than I could possibly ever tell you. And I'll always be there for you, whether it's buying dinner, going to church, just listening to one of your speeches. I don't have anything else to do. God bless all of you, and thank you very much.